Hello, it's Scott Medley here, and today I'm coming to you from uh, Iceland. Yeah, it's about half past 11 here, and there's still a serious glow on the horizon. I have not posted many videos in the last week. Um, yeah, the last one was a, a Q&A. <laughs> Because basically, uh, I've been at EVE FanFest in Reykjavik. Yeah, the EVE Online is a game which uh, has a long association with my channel. And there's actually, uh, I basically was invited to speak at this gaming conference, you know, EVE FanFest. Uh, yeah, and so I actually have a nice presentation, which uh, I'll link down there if you want to check it out. But um, that meant I didn't have much time to do any video creating. But I assure you, I have been running around after FanFest looking at all sorts of cool stuff like, uh, you know, the, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Anyway, this is a news video, Deep Space Update, so let's start, let's get up to date with all the news that we can find. So, in the last one, uh, I was talking about Angara 1.2 getting ready to launch. That actually launched before the video was published, but yeah, it has now officially been declared a success. We have, you know, some cool images of the launch which were released. It was a military launch. They did, of course, have the, you know, the a cardboard stenciled Z on the side. The satellite is Cosmos 2555. It's in like a 280 kilometer orbit, sun synchronous, very low orbit, so it might be like a radar satellite or something like that. It's also known that after putting the satellite into orbit, the upper stage then went into a different orbit showing that it could maneuver after that. Uh, also, uh, Starlink 416 launched. That is notable because the booster was turned around inside of a month. It was the same booster that launched Axiom 1. And according to a post on LinkedIn by uh, someone from SpaceX, uh, it, it basically said that they turned that booster around in the barn, in the, you know, the refurbished, the hangar, whatever they call it, in nine days, which is pretty impressive. Yeah, we got some traffic out here. I just... I can't find a quiet space in this house with your know, family. Uh, Changzheng, uh, or Long March, 11HS, that's Hache, sea launch. Basically, this is a sea launched version of the uh, Long March 11, which is an all so four stage solid rocket motor that uh, launched in the East China Sea carrying the uh, Gaofen 3D, which, uh, according to this, has a spatial resolution of 0.75 meters. And the 4A, which has a resolution of half a meter, they had four satellites on board. That was one of the, the 4D and one of the, or sorry, one of the 4A and th or four of the 3D. A total of like 267 kilograms. These are all Earth imaging satellites in a 535 kilometer sun synchronous orbit. Okay, and the big one that we were all super excited for last time was a Electron Rocket Lab. There and back again. Now, this was a you know, standard rideshare mission, a bunch of different satellites. There was like 24 Space B Swarm satellites. There was uh, some uh, eSpace demo satellites. Alba Orbital Orbit, they basically had a, a bunch of ride-alongs, but they also launched their Unicorn 2 satellite, which is going to be doing surveys of nightside luminosity, basically looking at, like, light pollution, I think, you know, for any customer that wants to buy that sort of thing. I think that's cool because they'll be able to use it to figure out if they can really see your uh, Christmas lights from space. But satellites were all very cool, they were very happy, but we were more excited for the recovery. That booster descended through the atmosphere, slowed down, popped the chute, and the helicopter was waiting to grab it. And there was a great moment of excitement as the helicopter moved in and snagged it while it was falling. However, there was a big, ah, oh, groan of pain as they dropped it. So according to Rocket Lab, there was some sort of oscillation load problem and the helicopter pilot basically cut the spacecraft or cut the booster loose. Now after they cut it loose, the parachute reinflated and it landed on the water and has been recovered. Uh, Peter, uh, yeah, Peter Beck thinks they might actually be able to reuse it. Now as for what went wrong, we're not really sure. Obviously they tested this a whole lot. They flew these and with a lot of dummy flights and mass simulators. It's possible that uh, there was you know, fuel slosh that made a difference this time. It's possible the mass was different. Um, possible that the, the chute didn't deflate in the same manner and therefore interacted with the propeller downwash. You know, 
Helicopters are complicated things, and if something starts rocking, you absolutely do not want that thing to knock you, you know, cause, build up into an oscillation and knock you down. And I understand that if, if I was flying that, I would cut it, you know? Oh, I, I can't fly helicopters, so I can't honestly say if it was a salvageable situation. But yeah, you know, you don't want to take any risks in this. Okay, moving forwards to the 5th of May, uh, there was a Long March 2D. Again, carrying it carried a satellite called Quan Fu, and another seven of the Garfin 3D. Again, the same ones that were on the Long March 11 that launched from the sea. 6th of May, while I was actually pretty much running around FanFest getting prepared to give a speech, SpaceX launched a Falcon 9 with another batch of Starlink satellites, and this launched just before launch, uh, sorry, dawn. And so again, this was a magnificent looking launch all across the East Coast. You could really see the giant jellyfish extending up into the pre-dawn sky. There are amazing photos if you find them out there. This was also the 12th reflight of this booster, and that booster was uh, 1058, I believe, the one which has the NASA logo on the site that was used for Demo 2. 9th of May, just uh, earlier today, Long March 7, carrying Tianzhou 4, that is the cargo spacecraft which serves the Chinese space station. So that, I believe, is currently in the process of rendezvousing and prepared to dock. Tianzhou 3, the previous cargo spacecraft, is still docked as of right now, and I think it's moved to a different docking port. So I think what's going to happen is Tianzhou 4 is going to dock, and then later, at the start of June, assu assuming everything works, we're going to get Shenzhou 14 with a new crew, and they will complete the cargo transfers. Uh, I think they're going to be able to use you know, Tianzhou 3 for, I don't know, garbage, or maybe there's supplies left in it. Anyway, that is launches. We're moving forward to future launches, and the one to watch next week is Starlink 4-15, which is going to be launching from Florida, and this is going to be launching onto a southerly trajectory, and it's going to, you know, thread the needle into the middle of the Bahamas, and the booster is basically going to land on the barge in the middle of the Bahama Islands, which is really, really cool. Uh, the idea, I think, is that the sea conditions will be so much calmer and safer and more benign compared to a North Atlantic passage. So this will make a lot of sense if they can do this. Now, I don't think this will work, you know, once hurricane season kicks in, but um, yeah, I, this one... So previously they recovered just north of the Bahamas, but that required a dogleg manoeuvre, so they had to reduce the number of satellites they were carrying. But with uh, this one, they're actually just going on a straight launch out of uh, Kennedy and there's no like dog legs so they can handle their full payload. And this is obviously required to get the buy-in of the government of the Bahamas. I, I'm sure there's some money involved. Uh, let me see, what else? Okay, uh, there's another one of these cool crowdfunding campaigns, or not crowdfunding, crowdsourcing campaigns from uh, NASA in collaboration with Hero X, And they are looking for... VR assets and mission designs and activities for training Mars astronauts. So this is, I think this is cool because I know a lot of people in game dev, uh, you know, I actually have a handle on how you do this. Now, it's not building scientific instruments, it's not trying to solve how to navigate on Venus. This is like literally, it's, it's like building mods for Take on Mars. I don't know if you know that game, which never really saw its fullest potential. Um, yeah, they're they're basically looking for assets, and they're gonna crowd. They're gonna pick up to twenty winners and share seventy thousand dollars of prize money between them. So that's fantastic, well worth your time if you've got uh, you know some skills in that area, and I'm sure a bunch of you do. Uh, let me see. Uh, oh, crew three, crew three has returned, of course now. So the station crew is back down to seven. And uh, yeah, not much to say about that, but it was a successful recovery. Very cool to watch that. Uh, also, an interesting piece of news that came out a couple of weeks ago, NROL85 launched out of Vandenberg. And if you remember, I got like pictures of that from you know, uh, Northern California. So an, an interesting piece of story came out about how that had moved from the East Coast to the West Coast. Now, normally... If that happened, the supplier would then have to pay a little bit of money because, you know, SpaceX would have been getting prepared for all the integration on the East Coast and had to switch all that to the West Coast. But apparently, instead of paying more, they decided to switch to a reused booster or, a, you know, a flight-proven booster. 
and whatever the cost difference, it was worth whatever SpaceX had already invested in setting up for this launch on the East Coast. Um, let me see, NASA had a big thing about Black Hole Week, which we were all like, oh my god, does this mean that we're going to see some more stuff from the Event Horizon Telescope? No, it didn't. It just meant that we saw some cool new visualizations and sonifications of black hole data. I did see a really cool like amateur program. The um, I, I can't remember who it was by. It was posted on Twitter. It was basically catching a bunch of amateurs, catching light ripples in Hubble's variable nebula. And I think this is marvelous because it shows what you can do with amateur telescopes. Now, of course, there are Similar examples of this taken with the Hubble Space Telescope that are way better. But again, the fact that you can do this with amateur telescopes is really amazing. So Hubble's variable nebula is a like a star that changes brightness. And as it changes brightness, it illuminates the nebula. And it does so on a sufficiently short time scale. You can see the light, the waves of brightness and darkness moving through the nebula at the speed of light. So they're like it's almost like light waves, but they're not. They're like waves of bright and then dark moving at the speed of light. Um, of course, again, we're still continuing to see lots of blood. There were several news uh, sources reported that Russia is leaving the International Space Station. And once again, it was confirmed that this was just Dmitry Rogozin blustering and not actually doing anything and hadn't actually notified NASA. So until you hear NASA saying that Russia is pulling out of the International Space Station. Don't believe a word that Dmitry is saying. Um, Booster 7, uh, Boca Chica, it had, of course, it had been leaked that it had suffered some serious damage to its downcomer. It had been collapsed into a triangular shape. Uh, the booster went back to the barn for a little bit of testing and refurbishment and is now back and is being tested. So presumably they fixed that and, uh, you know, 24-7 might still fly at some point. And also, since we've not been having so much in the way of fiery explosive testing happening down at Boca Chica, the crew from NASA Spaceflight have now set up a broadcast unit at uh, McGregor where they do all the engine tests. They now have a camera that points at the engine test stand and you can see all the Raptor engines as they're going through their testing. Uh, finally... Uh, well, actually, no, there's two. Oh, the, wait, no, I've just realized two things. I was going to say, finally, uh, we got this really cool time lapse video of Dream Chaser being built. So, Dream Chaser is still in, in manufacturing. They released this really cool video, and you can see the parts going together, how the little uh, folding wings actually move out and lock into position. Uh, you know, it's really starting to look like a spacecraft, and it's scheduled to fly. I, Next year, maybe the year, I think next year is when it's expected to fly to the ISS, but that's going to depend on Vulcan. Um, so yeah, looking forward to that. But Spin Launch, remember Spin Launch, the place that we're all very sceptical of and still think is very interesting. Um, they showed, they released a video from test flight number eight. I mean, now the fact they've got up to test flight number eight shows that they've pretty much managed to not throw a projectile into the side of the uh, into the side of the vacuum chamber like certain people predicted. But more importantly, the video shows uh, footage from the onboard camera on the projectile. So we actually see the projectile ascending upwards or looking downwards as it leaves the vacuum chamber moving at you know, supersonic speeds. You can see it wobbling. It doesn't spin. Some people you know, insisted that no, it was spinning end over end. No, it just sort of fishtails up and then uh, transitions into a roll stabilization. So that is extraordinarily good to see that they've got electronics working in that. Uh, you know, I still think that they still have uh, odds stacked against them. It's not that um, they can't solve the problems. I think that the sacrifices or the compromises you have to make to solve the problems, to launch things like that, are going to make it not competitive with traditional rockets. All the same, I think there's really important technology to develop because you can use this on other planets. Like, Earth is extraordinarily hard, but this same technology would be a really good thing to have if you were on the moon. So look, that is my report from Reykjavik. I, well, no, actually, this isn't Reykjavik. This is... Um, HUD, and I forget what it is. It's a little place 15 minutes south. Uh, I'm, I'll put a subtitle on as to what it is. 
Ricky Vic's pretty cool, by the way. A uh, lot of really cool stuff in there. Yeah, there's a penis museum and a punk museum and lots of sculptures. Um, highly recommend coming to Iceland sometime. It's, it, it has been fantastic here. Uh, don't try the rotten shark unless you're really, really into food dares. Yeah, I'll be back soon. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.